to the fourth video in Beetle Gust, where I have been making Beetlejuice themed miniatures all August long. And yes, I do realize this is the first day of September, and I do still have one more video to make. So happy Beetle Gust Timber! In this video, I will be creating the heart surgery patient and the shaman, who previously I referred to as the witch doctor, but after some research, I do believe that shaman is the correct term. And I'll be talking about that research a little bit later because it's really fascinating. So without further ado, let's start the surgery. Scalpel! This first doll will have images of heart surgery because I have to recreate that process. So if that's something you don't feel like you can handle or is a sensitive subject, please skip forward to the timestamp shown on the screen and it'll take you straight to the beginning of the shaman. Besides the actual open heart surgery part, I think this is going to be one of the easiest dolls I'm going to be creating. Very simple hospital gown. The hairnet may be a bit of a challenge just because I've never made one before, but everything else is pretty straightforward. Again, I'm using a doll body kit that is porcelain and fired in a kiln. And this is what I plan to make the hairnet out of. This was sent to me by a friend and it's a very fine mesh. So I'm hoping I can kind of sew a string into it, pull it together and make the hairnet. So first I'm going to put the doll body together in a similar way I've done all of the others with some pipe cleaners. I also made sure to have one of his legs be slightly longer than the other. And this is so I can cross his legs in front at the ankles. This is the pose he's in in the movie, and none of my other dolls are sitting this way, so I thought it would be fun to try and recreate it. I think it looks fairly natural. I added some cotton to bulk up the areas around the pipe cleaners, and then I decided I didn't want to add more clay to his legs, but I found a flesh-toned fabric and just added that around his legs and continued it up to his torso. I used a lot of epoxy sculpt in the last video and the dry times were just a lot. So I'm going to try using paper clay in this video and see if it works just as well. I'm going to be sculpting straight on top of his chest area and whenever I'm adding paper clay onto a previously hardened surface, I am going to be adding some tacky glue so that it takes hold. I can then smooth the paper clay into the rest of the body. While researching this, I found it really interesting that the incision for heart surgery is directly in the center of the chest, and it's not more off to the left side, which is where the heart is. So I originally was thinking maybe he's not having heart surgery because wouldn't it be off to the side where the heart is? But for some reason, it's right in the center of the chest in the images that I found. While the clay was still wet, I made the incision and allowed that to dry. Then I could start working on the heart and the other areas inside the chest cavity. I made the heart with just a little small piece of clay that I rounded, and then I made two little tubes that will come out of the top of the heart. Once everything was glued in place, I could go ahead and start shaping it a little bit more. I'm not going to have an exact replica of a human heart because this is so small, but I want to get it close enough that you can immediately know what organ is being shown in this chest cavity opening. After I was pretty happy with the shape of the heart, I flattened out some more pieces of clay to kind of create the outer skin area, and then I laid them along the edge so there was just a little bit of an overlap and then I made two indentions on each side, where later there will be pins that are keeping the chest cavity area open. Now I can go ahead and add a bit more clay to the sides of the torso. In the image, it does look like the patient does have a little bit more bulk, so I bulked out his body, which will also help his chest cavity opening look a little bit more natural. Once he was done, I allowed him to sit and dry. At this point, I decided to work on his undergarments. Not anything fancy, it's just a triangle of fabric that I glued onto the front of his torso and pulled around to the back. So this will cover him up a little bit while he's wearing that oh-so-stylish hospital gown. Now I can start painting the inside of the chest cavity. Before I do that, I'm going to lay down a layer of shiny Mod Podge to give it a very glossy base before I start adding the paint. 
I'm going to let that dry completely and then I'm going to be doing a base coat of black paint. And this is going to fill in any of those gaps that I don't end up adding red or any other colors to. So it does look like there's no light or any white coming from the inside of the body. I'm now going to be adding some red. And for this, I am looking at actual images of heart surgery to see what the heart really does look like. The images between the computer generated versions or the what you would find in a textbook type of images and what it actually looks like is incredibly different or so I have found. I'm still trying to the best of my ability to keep the gore factor down and so I am using the more muted colors that I was able to find that still seemed fairly accurate. I also went ahead and painted a little bit more of a skin tone even though this area won't be seen around the chest cavity because the heart patient's gown will be rather thin. After all of that is dry, I'm going to go ahead and put another coat of shiny Mod Podge over the top to give it that glossy look. While I had the paint out, I decided to go ahead and work on the face, and so I did some dark circles around the eyes, painted some white for the eyeballs, and then I decided to do white eyebrows because in the reference, his eyebrows did not seem super pronounced, and so maybe they were either a light color or white. I also had to go ahead and add some irises to the eyes, and it does look like he's looking down and reading a book. He is the one in the waiting room that will be actually looking down the most, and that's because the head was made to where his head was supposed to move, so I just glued it in a downward position. And any of these dolls that end up having sculpted toenails, I cannot resist painting them, even though in the end I do cover up his feet. It's just, it's too fun. I did give him some fingernails as well, and I went with dark gray. So here is how it is looking. The heart cavity I let dry completely before I moved on, but it did take a while. For his hair, I decided to not even mess with viscose because it is kind of annoying to work with, and I'm just going to be sculpting his hair with paper clay. After all, it will be covered up with a hairnet, although in the end, I think I probably should have gone with viscose because it does look like his hair is very different to anyone else in the waiting room. I used my craft knife to put some texture in and let that dry completely. After his hair was dry, I could go ahead and start painting it. I did want him to have white hair to match his white eyebrows. So first I'm gonna lay down some gray in areas where I think some gray hair or darker roots might be showing through. And then I'm gonna dry brush over all that texture I created with my craft knife in order to make it look like he has kind of a salt and pepper hair color. I do feel like the heart patient is one of the saddest deaths in the waiting room, probably because it's so relatable. Almost everyone's going to know someone who's gone in for a major surgery at some point in their life. I have a friend who had an entire heart transplant and uh, she's doing great now, but what a tense and nerve wracking time. All of the other deaths are a little bit more fantastical, such as a magician's assistant being sawed in half. Hopefully you don't know anyone that that has happened to. To detach myself from this character as much as the others, I've come up with a fantastical backstory for him. This is Dr. Hart. Dr. Hart was fascinated with self-surgery. Self-surgery is something I read about while I was looking up images of actual surgery so I could try to be as accurate as possible. It's this notion of doctors actually performing a surgery on themselves, obviously while they're still awake. It's really interesting to read about, but I found that a self-heart surgery had never been done, and nor should it. Just ask Dr. Hart. The hospital gown that I'm creating for him is basically just a gigantic t-shirt. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly since I've made a few different shirts in the past, and I will make sure to link an Adams Family doll video down below in the description if you want some more detail on how to go about creating a shirt. 
Now that I have the two arms on, I can start working on the tunic. The tunic I made extra long because I knew I was going to have to custom fit it so that you could only just barely see his legs coming out the front. I want to make sure to cover up that fabric that I had added to his legs. I'm cutting a slit down the back of the tunic because as we know, those hospital gowns have a lovely nice long slit in them and never quite close all the way. Once I had fitted it to the doll, I could go ahead and cut off any excess and hem the edge. I decided to also add a collar because this is what I typically do to finish off a shirt or a jacket. However, you will see I change that up a little bit later. In order to start attaching it to his body, I added some glue just above the heart surgery opening and started pressing down the shirt into the glue and I allowed that to dry. I'm cutting an opening into the front of the gown with some flush cutters and I'm being very careful to make sure that the opening is exactly the size of the incision. I'm also going to cut a few snips into the side so that I can tuck it underneath the opening and add a tiny bit of glue. This is going to keep the frayed edges out of the way of my heart surgery area. After that, I can go ahead and glue it to the body itself so that I am certain my gown is going to be out of the way of any of the tools I need to create for this section. And for an added bit of detail of realism that you'll never see, I left the back of the gown open because we all know that's just how it is. As I said previously, I'm going to be using this very fine mesh to try and create the hairnet that's going to go onto his head. I'm using a circle template and a white gel pen to first trace out the circle. This is just an experiment, this first part, to see if this will actually work. I cut it out and then I used a very thin thread and needle to go around the edge back and forth so that I could eventually pull the strings and make the hairnet bottom part come together. And it did work in theory, however, I realized as I pulled tighter to get it actually around the shape of the head, the strings started pulling at the edges of the netting and it was coming loose. So I had to start over again, but this time I am going to fray check the edges with a bit of tacky glue. This is going to stop the strings from pulling out of the edges. I also didn't like how sheer it was, so I added two layers this time and slowly Slowly started to pull at them. This worked much better this time and I didn't have any problems of the strings trying to pull out of the mesh fabric. Everything held together and this could possibly be because I used two layers of the mesh as well. I really love the opacity of it now, so I'm happy I did the double layer. To start adding it to my patient, I added some glue to the very top front of his forehead right underneath his hair. I do actually think that the clay hair helped the hairnet stay in place. If it had been viscose, I would not have had that hard ledge that I could push against and make sure that the hairnet would stay in place. Once I was happy with its placement, I added a bit of glue to the back and pulled the strings tight. And at this point, my string broke and I panicked because I was afraid the entire thing would come undone and I would have to start over. However, everything stayed in place because I had been adding glue all around the sides of the head as I went along. So I was very thankful for this. Here's how the hairnet is looking. I think it is a little bit big, but overall I'm happy with it. I also decided at this point to cut the collar off. The collar just did not look right to me. It did not look like a hospital gown collar. It needs to have a much lower profile. So I cut the collar off, which I thought, oh no, I'm just gonna ruin this gown and have to rip it off. But thankfully it did not get ruined and I could use a much thinner, flatter collar to go around the edge to cover up any fraying. And I think this looks much more like a hospital gown. Now it's time to work on the retractor and I was calling it a detractor for a while and that's a whole different thing. So this is a retractor which is a device used in the medical field to keep the incision open while they work. In the movie I'm pretty sure the incision's being opened by forceps. You can see like little handles on the side. However, I felt like this was going to make a much bigger visual impact for this character and it's probably a little bit easier to create than tiny little forceps, especially needing like multiples of them. 
To create the retractor, I just cut out little strips of cardstock that I had painted silver and started cutting them into shape. They're all flat pieces uh, in the real piece, and so they're pretty easy to recreate out of flat paper. I cut the little edges of where the retractor is wound open by just cutting into the cardstock. I glued everything together. I added a few extra little screw holes by just punching it with something sharp. And then I added some L-shaped pieces of cardstock on the side in those areas I had sculpted so that the incision would stay open. In the movie, you can see that he is wearing little hospital booties, and so I decided to paint some fabric with blue watercolor to get the perfect hospital color for these blue shoes. I think everybody recognized this hospital blue. I'm going to be making probably the most simple shoes I ever have, where I'm just adding it around the back of the heel, pushing it over the front, and then I'm adding some little soles out of the same material to the bottom. Then I'm just going to cut off any excess material and make sure it's glued down. I do have one shoe that I like better than the other one, but since his feet are crossed, I'm glad it's on the foot that's going to be in front. Now he has one accessory left to make, which is a book. It's hard to see in the movie, but it does look like he is actually the only one reading the handbook. And I did have this handbook that was sent to me by a viewer, so thank you for that. And it actually has writing on the inside, so I thought it would be the perfect book to add. And he just looks like he is hanging out and relaxing in the waiting room. The heart surgery patient is now complete. He's reading his handbook and probably looking for some loopholes to get himself out of the waiting room. Now we can move on to the shaman. I believe that this character is supposed to represent a Shuar shaman from either Ecuador or Peru. This is because the Shuar were known for creating the shrunken heads. And as you can see in the movie, that's clearly a talent he has. Interestingly enough, the Shuar were not interested in the heads themselves as trophies, but instead the soul of the people whose head they shrunk. By the 19th and 20th century, Europeans and Euro-Americans began trading manufactured goods, specifically shotguns, to the Shuar shaman in return for shrunken heads. And who do we know with a shrunken head? And who else do we know with a weapon? So my theory of what happened is that Harry the Hunter decided to make a deal with the shaman in return for his weapon to get a shrunken head. Something happened, the deal went wrong, and the shaman got mad. Um, not good to back out of a deal with a shaman, Harry. And then his head got shrunk, and I do believe that's probably the way he died, and not something that happened in the waiting room. And because the shaman actually collected his soul during that process, now every time that Harry needs to go to the waiting room for his appointment, the shaman has to go with him. And I don't think either one of them are very excited about that. No. I'm not a historian or a film theorist, but I do think this was an interesting look and an interesting bit of history behind what the original creators of this scene might have been thinking. That's enough talking, let's go ahead and create the shaman. For the character of the shaman, I really think I over collected on things that I needed, but honestly in the movie it was kind of hard to see the details. So I'm going to be going more for textures and colors and trying to stay as close to screen accuracy as I can. I received this doll kit and it was broken and the artist offered to replace it for me. However, I knew that the torso was going to be a bit too long anyway, so I told her not to worry about it. So I'm using the same technique I used with the magician's assistant where I'm just slowly breaking off pieces until it's as short as I think it needs to be. To put his body together, again, I'm using pipe cleaners. However, I decided to try using paper clay for his legs because his torso was going to be a little bit difficult to add. And this way, once the paper clay was in place, I could squish the torso into the top. By doing this, I'm hoping that the bottom part of the torso will be protected and won't break anymore. Just like I did with the epoxy sculpt in last week's video, I was trying to smooth the paper clay into the body that was already created. Then I tried to match the skin tone as best as I could and painted over the paper clay 
So if you did end up seeing more of the leg than was in the kit, it looks cohesive. I purchased this small amount of trim specifically for the neck piece that you can see in the movie. It is way too large in its current state to go around the neck of the doll with any success, so I ended up cutting off bits and creating my own bit of trim by gluing it onto some faux black leather material that I had previously created. I'm using Fabri-Tac to do this and just pushing all the individual pieces into the glue. Once that had started to tack up, I could go ahead and cut off any excess. Then I added another layer of glue on top of the pieces. This is just in case there were any extra bits that didn't get glued down. I don't want them to be falling off later. Then I added another thinner layer of the fringe on top of that glue just to hide any of the glueiness that you might see after it dries. And then once that dried, I went ahead and did my final trim so that I had a completed piece to start working on the neck. So I decided at this point to put this to the side to dry and work on the face paint before I started working on the clothes because there's always that risk that you will get paint on the clothing. This has to be one of the most interesting dolls to paint the face because he does have a skull painted on his face. Now this is going to look rather awkward to begin with, but I decided to lay down a layer of black before adding the white on top. I'm going very slowly and paying careful attention to the movie screen reference to try and be as accurate as possible. His face shape is very different from the actor that portrayed this character in the movie. However, I was paying more attention to the face paint and not worrying so much if the face does not look exactly the same to the actor. I ended up using toothpicks in this process quite a bit because there are so many fine details including the teeth and getting around areas that are just very small. To finish up the face paint, I added some very dark lines down the neck, which you can see in the movie, and this was the finished look. I'm really happy with it, and once I put the headdress on, I think it looks even better. To start working on the neck piece, I first put it against the doll and cut it off to the length that I thought would work. Then I added glue in the front, let that dry so it was held in place, and then glued it around the neck, carefully curving it so it looked close to the body. When it came to the cloth that's going around his waist, it was really hard to see what exactly the material looked like, so I went with some colors and patterns that I thought would kind of give the same effect where you can't really tell what it is, however it has the colors that are in the rest of the look. I used one long length of fabric with one frayed edge for this and made sure to cover up the bottom of his body and then the rest of it I just gathered as I went making sure it was close to his waist. While that was drying, I decided to use this really beautiful trim that was sent to me by a friend from Singapore, and I just thought this would work really well. I cut off the extra part that I didn't think would look right, and I realized there's not a lot of gold in what he's wearing, but I felt like the texture was right, and so I just kept going with it. Also in the movie, you cannot see his feet. However, I wanted to continue with this and I added these around his ankles. I used one on each ankle, making sure that the fringe was really short. And also on one of the ankles, I added a black thread. And I just, I hope that I'm still doing justice to what he's wearing, but I just kind of had to guess on the lower parts. He does have a pouch that he pulls a magical substance out of, so I'm going to be creating this with some faux leather that I created with paint and fabric. I'm adding some hot glue to the center and letting that dry so that there is a bump. Then I'm going to fold the faux leather over the bump and push down the edges so it does look like something's inside the pouch. I glued down the sides and once that was dry I could carefully go around the edges and cut out the shape of the pouch. Then I could add some string around the top of the pouch and allow that to dry. I just added a little daub of glue and tied a simple knot. Once that's completely dry and I'm happy with the shape, I can go ahead and add it to the shaman himself. I'm going to glue the pouch on first, making sure I think it looks where it would hang naturally, and then I can 
add the strings going up underneath his neck piece so that they kind of disappear underneath there. Of course, I had to add details to his toes, so this time I'm going for more of a natural look. And I really enjoyed this process, just like I have every other set of toes. After painting his fingernails, it was finally time to move on to the headpiece, which is the part that I was excited for the most. When you first watch the movie, it might be hard to tell, but he does have a jaguar head on top of the headpiece. It's a little bit flat and it doesn't stand out a lot, but that is what it is. So I had to try and recreate a jaguar head. And so I'm going to be using my toilet paper paper mache method that I've used for Delia's couches that are made out of cowhide. However, this time I'm going to be using a bright orange and some brown instead of black and white. While the small section of paper mache is still wet, I'm using some watered down orange paint and letting that soak in to the toilet paper. This also starts to warp the paper a little bit and it gives it this really interesting texture which makes it look more like a hide. Before the paper mache dries, I'm going to push it on top of a pin and then I'm going to tape it down so that it dries in a bit of a dome shape. This is going to help me make it look like a jaguar head in the end. So I'm going to let it dry this way and once it's done, I can remove it, take it off of the wax paper, which is what I put the paper mache on top of, and start to make it look like a jaguar. Because the screenshot from the movie was a little bit difficult to use as a reference, I ended up looking up an actual shaman headdress that uses a jaguar in it and using that for her reference. I'm going to start by painting some of the definite features of a jaguar and then going back and adding some spots and filling in spaces. I kept checking my reference because it kept feeling like I was creating a tiger. I don't know, it just has more of a tiger feel to me, but it was a jaguar that I was referencing and it is pretty similar to the one that ends up on the headdress in the movie. Once I was happy with the paintwork, I went ahead and cut out the shape and two extra triangles for the ears. In all the references, I saw the ears were sticking straight up out of the jaguar head. So I glued those on top and added a little bit more paint to the ends to give them some black, just like the rest of the head. Here's how the ears were looking once they were attached. I also added a little bit of glossy Mod Podge to the eyes and the nose. Once that was complete, I could start working on the headdress, which was going to have feathers and more of that trim that I had used for the neck piece. I looked through the collection of feathers and found some pieces that had a natural downturn, which you can see is pretty noticeable in this shaman's headdress in the waiting room. I added some glue on top of his head and started sticking in the feathers until I felt like it looked correct. At this point, I was just trying to get the correct shape, and later on I go back and trim it down if the feathers end up being a little bit too big. The rest of the headdress is a little bit difficult to make out because the footage is so dark and he's against a dark backdrop and the headdress is dark itself. So I'm making it up a little bit with some images I found online as reference and also matching the previous neck piece that I created. I added glue to his head and then made sure that the pieces from the trim were sticking straight up. Then I could trim them down so it looked like a more manageable length. Once I was happy with the black trim pieces, I could go ahead and glue on the Jaguar. This really helped shape the black trim pieces and I was much happier with the headpiece once the Jaguar was attached. And this is probably because it's a very important and central part of the headpiece. Then I used a little bit of paint to transition it into the black parts of the headpiece and this is how it ended up looking in the end. If you're a historian or familiar with the Shuar culture, I would love to know if you think I did okay with the back of the headdress. While I was going through the bag of feathers, I found a few really tiny ones and I decided to cut them down so they looked like they were more in scale. 
In the movie, you can see that the shaman has an armband and there's a few items in the armband. I'm not quite sure what they are, so I didn't want to add just random bits of anything. So I decided to add a feather, seeing as feathers were an important part of the headdress. I just used a bit of embroidery thread to tie and glue that onto the arm. I have one final thing to create, which I am calling the skull stick. You can see that he is holding it in the waiting room. It's a little bit difficult to see any other details except for the small skull that's on top of the stick. However, I do believe it's rather short because he is holding it into his lap. I'm going to be using a decorative toothpick to recreate this. I'm just going to add some tacky glue onto the end and add a small bit of paper clay to begin sculpting the very small skull. This was so tiny to work on. I'm using the end of a small paintbrush to push in the eye sockets and then I'm also going to be using a toothpick to make the nostril holes and also the mouth. After I let this dry for quite a while, I started the painting process. I'm going to paint the skull white and then use a toothpick with black paint to fill in some of the details. Because it was so small, I did accidentally overpaint the mouth, so it looked like a bit of a mess, but of course I could always go back with some white paint and clean it up. I painted the rest of the stick a black because it did blend in so much with the dark footage. And then I'm adding another one of those really tiny feathers that I had cut down as a detail onto the skull stick. After that was dry, I added some more thread and I used a different color so it would stand out against the black. I added some to the top right underneath the skull and then allowed that to dry and added a bit more to the bottom of the stick as well, including some black thread. And I just used the edge of my fingernail to fray the ends of the thread a little bit to give it more of a worn look. And here is the completed skull stick that I'm going to be adding to my shaman. I glued it into his hand so it looks like he's naturally holding it against his leg. The arms didn't bend so I had to come up with a different way to glue that in. Along with the book that was sent in that I used for the heart patient, this ticket was sent in, which is a reference to the very end of the movie where Beetlejuice trades the shaman his ticket for the number four. And um, yeah, the shaman doesn't like that too much. Now it's time for the fun part, which is putting them all in place. And now that there's so many waiting room characters complete, I get to figure out where they're going to fit the best. And the only one that's really set in stone on where he needs to stay is the scuba diver because that shark needs space. So let me know if you like the setup I came up with. There's really only one seat left. However, the three-seater couch really doesn't have enough space for anyone else to sit comfortably, especially since the hunter is so wide. And I realized I hadn't put Beetlejuice in any of these Beetlegust videos. And now that the shaman and the headhunter were complete, I had to add him into the waiting room, especially sitting between these two, just to kind of recreate that iconic scene at the end of the movie. Most likely he won't stay here. However, it is nice to know that he does have a seat if he needs to go be in timeout, I guess we'll say. And now I have one final position to fill. So that's all I have for you today. We have one more video to create where I will be making, finally, Miss Argentina and uh, the flat guy. And once they are done, I will be turning on the waiting room lights and we will get a final look at this completed scene. Let me know if you have any other theories behind these characters or any of the other characters in the waiting room. I think it's fascinating how they've all kind of taken on their own storyline, even though some of these characters aren't even credited in the movie. But now they have a special place in our hearts. I hope you all have an amazing week and I will see you in the next one. Happy Beetlegust. So detach, so, so detach, so to detach, <laughs> The green is starting to get to me. So to de <clears throat> Woof! Okay. <laughs> so to detach so to detach. So to de 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 <laughs>